Michael Pollan, who has an enormous bestseller called In Defense of Food, has as guidelines linking agriculture, food, nutrition, and sustainability, um, guidelines saying eat food, not too much, eat mostly plants, because these are better for the planet and don't use as much natural resources. And then he has some guidelines, and I'm only listing a few of them here, uh, but one of them is to pay more for food and eat less. Um, he thinks people should be doing more cooking which I think is great, and he wants people planting a garden. So these are his personal responsibility guidelines for uh, not only health, but also sustainability. Um, but other groups have talked about the more social responsibility uh, aspects of the climate change and of the of, of climate change and of the world food crisis that we're dealing with a group called the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy published a report a couple of years ago called Food Without Thought uh, how United States farm policy affects the obesity epidemic linking food farm policy very clearly to the rise in obesity. And Dan Imhoff, who's a writer in New York, has written a book about how you deal with farm issues in a more sustainable way. And one of the points that they make is that the changes in the agricultural system have caused, have led to the present crisis, and it's the way we do our farming. <laughs> Um, there there have been, has been an enormous drop in the number of farms in the, in the United States over the year. The peak year for farming was in the 1940s. Now we have many, many fewer farms, but they are much, much larger, run by very large corporations and usually growing one single crop, mostly corn or soybeans. Um, and this is a very unsustainable way of looking at agriculture, since those are food for animals, not for people. And then, of course, there's the use of uh, fuel of uh, crops like corn and soybeans for ethanol production. Uh, about one third of the United States corn crop this year is being grown to produce biofuels. Um, and British Petroleum <coughs> advertises that cars should eat their vegetables too. How's that for nutritional, a good nutritional idea? Um, or that sugar beets, corn, wheat are recipes for renewable fuel. This seems very short-sighted to me. And we now have buses run on soy oil. Um, so that we're now competing, fuel is now competing uh, for food, with people for food. Um, and the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy also uh, has produced reports in which they talk about how our formerly, or at least still, relatively cheap commodities, corn, soybeans, and wheat, have fostered an enormous food marketing in industry. And this I'm going to talk about a little bit more. Because with the cost of food so low under the present set of policies that we have, there's no reason for people to garden, there's no reason for them to bake their own bread, and there's no reason for them to cook their own meals because it's cheaper to have other people do it for us. Obviously, none of this is sustainable. Um, and in fact, the sustainability issues have, are so prominent that various groups in the United States have proposed their own sets of dietary guidelines. Not only do you eat foods for health reasons, but you also should be eating foods that are in season, that are organic, that are free of genetically modified organisms, pasture-raised, sustainable, predator-friendly, shade-grown, and salmon-safe. This is a lot of issues, and it's no wonder that the public is deeply confused about nutrition issues and about what to eat. And I think it's too bad that the public is so confused and finds nutrition, health, and sustainability issues so difficult to parse out, because you don't have to be a genius to figure out what it is you're supposed to eat for dinner. It's not all that difficult. Um, and in fact, I have my own set of guidelines for this that I published in my, uh, that I wrote in my book, What to Eat, and that's just simply eat less, move more, eat plenty of fruits and vegetables, don't eat too much junk food, and enjoy what you're eating. And that pretty much takes care of nutrition advice, and these are also quite sustainable <laughs> recommendations. But if recommendations this simple are difficult to follow, and if they seem controversial, it's surely because of the effect of such recommendations on the food industry. 
And the, uh, an executive of Coca-Cola a couple of years ago gave a interview with Advertising Age in which she talked about the enormous challenge that obesity poses for food companies. The challenge is a very simple one. If you're going to do something about obesity, you have to eat less. Eating less is very bad for business and the food industry knows it. So her statement was, our Achilles heel is obesity. Obesity causes an enormous challenge for us. It used to be something we can ignore, and now it's an enormous, enormous problem. Well, you could say exactly the same thing about sustainability. If the food industry had to produce food sustainably, it would pose an enormous challenge for the food industry. Um, so if this is a, if obesity is a challenge, and I want to talk about obesity a little bit as an example, um, then there are two approaches to doing something about obesity. And the first is the one uh, posed by this rather offensive cover from the Economist, um, which was the, and I think it just exemplifies the personal responsibility approach beautifully. If you think that obesity is a matter of personal responsibility, um, then you just view people as being personally responsible for what they eat. If people want to eat themselves to an early grave, let them. The remedy for obesity is very simple. You just teach people how to eat better and hope that they will do it. And if they have sense enough, they will. Well, those of us who have been in nutrition education for a long time know that that approach is not very effective. And the reason that it's not very effective is because social responsibility has a great deal to do with it. And this has to do with what the New York Times called the gorge yourself environment, too much food, too many choices. Um, and too much eating. And here the remedy is much more complicated. You have to change society if you want to create an environment that helps people eat healthfully and sustainably. And changing society is always much more con difficult to contemplate. So if we're going to talk about changing society, we have to talk about what it is about society that needs changing. And in order to do that, we have to go back to the beginning of the obesity, of the rise in rates of obesity, which in the United States began in the early 1980s. And so we have to ask the question, what was it that happened in the early 1980s that caused people suddenly to be eating more and moving less? Well, I think there are two major reasons for it. The first had to do with an enormous shift in the United States farm policy, in which we went from a policy that controlled the amount of food that was in the food supply to one that encouraged farmers to grow absolutely as much food as they absolutely could. And the result of that, shown in the right on this slide, was an enormous rise in the number of calories available in the food supply, from 3,200 in the early 1980s to the present 4,000 per capita calories available in the food supply for every man, woman, and child in the country. Now that's not what people are actually eating. That's what's available for consumption. And even with the 1,400 calories that the Department of Agriculture says are wasted, that still leaves us 2,600 calories a day uh, for, for every person in the country. That's quite a lot. That makes the food industry extremely competitive. If you're a food company in that situation, your job is to try to sell your product in a situation in which there's twice as much food available as anybody could possibly use. 